so uh, pleased to be here and a little bit freaked out because this topic is so big and I'm a finance professor. So why, why am I here? I'm going to start by um, telling you a little bit about that. So we're, uh, let me tell you uh, sort of why, why I'm here. Uh, the topic is clearly very important and that's really why I wanted to talk about it. So I taught a course here in spring 2019. Sorry, this is 19. Um, so I taught a course called Is the Internet Broken? Can, and then this article in the Insight was saying, can it be fixed? And then it said it wasn't long ago, the idea of connecting computers was a wonderful thing. And we thought that it would be great in the utopian world, we would be empowered and everything, prosperity, democracy would be much better. So there was a lot of utopia around this. And then of course, what, how did it turn out? Now I taught this course with uh, a very unusual co-teacher who was actually a co-producer of the Silicon Valley series uh, on HBO. And I got to be a technical advisor, if you, it goes very fast, but the credits at the end uh, include me as a technical advisor. I didn't really get paid, uh, uh, but the, we got invited. The big perk was we got invited to the very last showing of the uh, uh, filming of the last episode uh, of it and we got to write it on the board behind uh, um, the characters, you know, here's Middle Ditch, uh, if you saw this, and we got to be in the ceremony of sort of a Stanford graduation. Anyway, uh, like Silicon Valley, but uh, it, 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 there was an impact of the course on it and you can read about it there. So um, my advocacy started on banking, which is more closer to finance. I was never in banking, but I started looking at it. And so why was I, did I get interested in the internet? Because it was becoming important. And I was curious about the, the difference, the contrast and similarities between banking and the internet. So banking is about intermediating money and the internet is about sort of intermediating data. And there are issues around control and governance uh, and the harms in both sectors are sort of invisible. It's about speech, it's about, you know, loans, uh, uh, it's about financial crisis, things like that. And expertise matters. So both of them have technical expertise that matter in the weeds of the system as well as about the rules. And, and, and sort of issues of salience to the public come up about wh wh whether the public can actually understand uh, some of these issues, which is sort of how I got to, you know, write the book and get out there uh, from, from my uh, little bubble in, uh, in academia. So what I'm trying to do in this presentation is I'd like to, there's tons of details, we would never really get through it. And lots of questions, which I wanna hear what you have uh, questions of and try to answer them. But I wanna try to give you a general framework that I hope will help you understand some of the issues. We're gonna narrow it to the internet sector and to the questions of policing speech. Uh, but let me frame the discussion first and try to see sort of the forest from, and the trees and we'll try to get through a little bit of the trees, but I hope to give you some guidelines there. So, um, I asked this question, my students, including better health, when I taught the course, uh, Jonathan Dutan and I wrote, uh, wrote the course, and I, I, I removed better health here, but you could see nobody said privacy to what you said here, okay? So big picture. I teach power in finance right now, and uh, so that course that I told you about was only taught once as a compressed course. And I think we should teach more of it, but you know, I'm here because kind of few other people in the business school are thinking about these things. But anyway, so I teach power in finance and I draw the picture a little bit differently. I drew it here on media, which includes traditional media. And then it's like new media forms, digital platforms, apps, social media. And then you got the rest of the world and you got the government and you got all of us individuals possibly related to some of these, but it's certainly interacting with them. I want to introduce the word governance. Okay. Uh, it was, uh, in my introduction was said that I'm interested in governance. That's how I came into the space of policy from issues about corporate governance, shareholder activism, whatever. But I wanna frame that word because I wanna use it. It's a big theme, okay? Who makes decisions? What information and constraints do they have? And what do they want to do? Or what should they want to do? How should we structure that situation? So, and then when you ask how the outcome of the 
situation, the way things are governed, affects everybody, then you start asking how should we design governance system. So big words associated with governance are power, obviously, information, and incentives. So these are kind of the, the words that are put in sentences related to governance. Uh, we might not say the word governance, but we we'll say these words, who has power, who has incentive, who has information. To get effective governance, kind of governance that works, you need trust, okay? So there, somehow in the system has to create trust, has to give people a way to commit to something that they won't harm other people, and has to have a measure of accountability if people sort of betray the trust. So the question is, how do we bring these into a system, okay? So trust is a big word, okay? This says, trust me, and behind it, it says, I'm lying, okay? So it's a big question. How do you generate trust? What do we trust? Who do we trust? So that's when you talk about trust crisis, you know, crisis in trust in institution, uh, crisis in trust in, in governments, etc. So trust me, that's talk. Talk is cheap, especially on the internet. So saying stuff, how do you get people to trust you when you say stuff? Is it fake news? Is it misinformation, disinformation, who you can trust. Lots of people are speaking today. So of course, 50 years ago, Milton Friedman said uh, something that has affected uh, a lot of things, including business school teaching a lot. So, so in a finance course, that would be a version of what we teach, that what you do is maximize, you know, profit, share price, something like that, okay? But he said, uh, while conforming to the basic rules of society, those embodied in the laws and, and those embodied in ethical custom, okay? So he said, make as much money, but obey the rules of society. Now, in business schools, we usually ignore governments, but James Madison said way back, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Okay, uh, but then he said, and this is really important for governance, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. Now, whether corporations control themselves or who controls them, that remains a question, but this was said just about the gov government. At the time, there was no mention of corporations in the constitution and any of these. So I wanna use the word rules and that's the way I think to think about it because there are lots of words floating around with all kinds of connotations, but rules are basically something that are trying to offer us a way to commit to certain behavior, okay? Sometimes they're written by governments and sometimes they're written in the private sectors. When students come to campus right now, they have to sign the Stanford Compact. It basically tells them they, you know, it's COVID. They can't, you know, have parties or whatever. Uh, they have to get tested, so they have to sign. The way of honor code, etc. So these are written in the private sector and say, okay, if you belong in this community, that's what you have to do. So terms of service, privacy policy, community standards, all these names, charters of corporations, bylaws, ethical norms, etc., versus the rules written by governments or across governments, laws and regulations and acts and treaties, directives, executive orders, and all rules, including even constitutions that are sort of at the base of any sort of governed society, sovereign or, or local government, uh, need adjudication and enforcement. So you always need some referee on it. And I'm adding separate slide related to tech, code. So the words that are related to rules have been used for algorithms, for protocols, for architecture. In this book from 1999, the start of the internet, code is the most significant form of law. And it's up to lawyers, policymakers, and citizens to decide what values the code embodies. So you see here words all about computer code back in 99 by a law professor, Larry Lessig. And of course, these are formal rules and there are also implicit rules. There are societal norms, there are ethical norms. So I'm just putting it in perspective, yes, some rules are formal. The speed limit is formal and the policeman will stop you. We decided we don't want people to drive fast, okay? And that's what we decided as a society to live by. We made these rules, okay? So I wanna use the word rules for all of those things. And it's just a question of who sets them, what enforcement mechanisms they have for them, or are they just informal rules that we enforce as a, as a society or internal rules that we follow ourselves? Democracy is, 
the governance of the pe government of the people by the people for the people. So, you know, it is in crisis at the moment. And I think a lot of these things are related. So democracy is about sort of the governance of a, of, of, of a nation, okay, if it's a democratic nation. So the question we have is how does society monitor private and public institutions and who is accountable and who is accountable when uh, in the corporations and in the government when they cause harm. We recently had the governor of Michigan be accused of the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Until then, it was really crazy that, uh, that, that nobody was accountable when so much harm was done to, to citizens of Flint, Michigan. Uh, about their water. So that's just an example. We need accountability everywhere. And one big issue is opacity of both governments and corporations. Can governance and democracy work in the dark? Can we, how do we know what's going on? How do we hold people accountable? So democracy requires, it's a sort of a shared uh, kind of process, committed and informed citizen who believe in distributed power, believe in compromise, informed debate, all these things are very quaint today, a set of interlocking institutions, representative bodies, courts, media, decision-making mechanisms for how we make decisions as a society. But what if powerful people don't really believe in democratic values? And what if some sectors of the economy and in particular, I do mean banking and internet, are at odds with the machinery of democracy for whatever reasons, the incentives within them can, can clash with democracy. And I think that's the case for both of these. So in the big picture, we also like in a business school context to make a contrast between market, big uh, free market and big government and all of that. And that is really a false contract because a contrast because there is no market without rules of market. Again, where, whether they're set by government or not and who's best to set them. The key feature is what are the rules of the game for markets, for institutions, for people? Who determines the rule? Who can enforce the rules and how? Um, and if it is true that the governments are failing and therefore companies need to save us and be sustainable and solve all societal problems, why is the government failing? What has gone wrong that our democracies are failing uh, to do the right things on whatever it is? Okay, that's the question I think better asked uh, as a basic question that should be a concern to all of us. Uh, so this is adjudication at large, you know, the referee had to see the foul, had to give the red card. This is from soccer. Uh, and then, you know, it has to be sort of fairly adjudicated. So now let's focus on internet. Internet-based corporations that are fairly new, and for, in some of, for some of us, it's really in our lifetime, we didn't grow up with internet, at least I didn't. The, you do search on internet, do you do commerce on internet nowadays, uh, and media. So we'll focus on that. Now, the large platforms uh, are large indeed and affect people beyond the reach of governments on the issues that they affect people on. So Facebook has 2.8 billion monthly users uh, and the population of China is half of that. Alibaba is a tech company, a Chinese one, and it has 757 million users, which is twice the or more the population of the US. So when the internet started, there was this declaration of independence. That is a part of what you're, we're dealing with now. Government of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of the mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. So this is one of the initial you know, hippies that started the internet and there is a tone to it, which is, you know, get out of the way, the internet will solve, will, will be it. And the governments should not bother us. And that was sort of a guiding principle for most governments, except the Chinese one, that pretty soon realized that they are not going to be out of the way at all. They're going to actually take over. So this has now become famous. Before I started teaching this course and really immersing myself in the subject, uh, I didn't know what section 230 is, but now it's spoken at every, you know, a lot of uh, public uh, forums. Uh, the 26 words that changed, that created the internet are, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content 
provider. In other words, third party, our posts. The provider is like a telephone, like a bookstore. They're not liable for the content. They're just a platform. So if you, if you listen, when, when a Google uh, CEO is in front of Congress, they keep saying, are you new? Are you media? Are you media? And he's like, no, 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 we're platform, we're platform, because they need that, that, that classification to work. Jeff Kosov, who wrote a whole book about this, says that this, uh, the, the background for this, we, we don't have time to discuss really, but it had to do with content moderation by Podgy and CompuServe and all of that. It reflects this section of the Communication Decency Act of 1996, at the very start of the internet, reflects an implicit contract between Congress and the technology community. If online platforms develop responsible and reasonable moderation procedures, we will give them immunity on what they post, what they take down, all of that. Otherwise, they, you know, with the billions of, of things that get posted, you know, they, they, um, you know, it would be difficult. So that was the idea was sort of a, a, a deal. And it was widened, you know, it was a, a bipartisan thing and, uh, and, and, and it was attached to the communication, which gave the internet an exception on every medium that it touches, including uh, uh, communication and media. So now I have a, a question for you. Do you think technology companies should be legally responsible? Sorry, uh, I, I meant, uh, yeah, so this is section 230. So legally responsible for the content they carry on their system. So should we repeal 230, which is what people uh, sometimes say. Trump said, you know, Biden was questioning. Um, it's in the discussion right now. So most of you uh, think, uh, yeah, so two thirds of you, almost 60%, uh think yes uh okay so i asked this quest so first of all let me show you how people in a survey in 1918 so almost three years ago right after mark zuckerberg kind of almost for the first time testified before congress so this is when the issues became kind of after cambridge analytica and all of that 84 percent of the public said in april 2018 yes sort of you said 60 percent my students who are also close to you in the class, 55% said yes. When we just sort of introduce the uh, thing, we can discuss the problems. Most legal scholars are uh, against uh, repealing 230 uh, as a, a section 230, like repealing entirely and making them liable. Uh, and, and we can discuss why, because what, what, what will basically happen is they will just stop, uh, stop publishing. Now, this, is, this was weird for me to revisit because uh, exactly two years to the day, February 25, 2019, there was a very a big story in, I, I give you the link everywhere. So when you go back to the slides, which we will post, you can explore. Uh, this, the, 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 the mask on the face was not COVID. This is April, this is February, 2019, a year before we were aware of COVID uh, about a year ago. And it was about the mental uh, health and the work conditions of these contract workers that are the content moderation moderator for Facebook. What they get to see, what they get to decide in or out or push to somebody higher up, the secret lives of Facebook moderators in America is very, you know, it even has a content warning at the bottom. Content warning, you're about to see something about mental health problems and, and racism because, so, so it, it was a really a trigger uh, uh, warning on this story. Uh, in November of uh, last year, a year and a half ago, the New York Times published, a, a, if you have a, a, a subscription to the New York Times, I recommend that you do this online. It was actually a printed magazine with a cover of the blue background cat, angry cat. The internet didn't turn out the way we hoped. It, it has a lot of art and a lot of, it's very unnerving to see it online because things keep jumping at you and moving and the cat and the angry cats and all of that. So it's kind of that, oh, and this is a cartoon you have to see. It's this new app. You put in your social security number, it makes you look like a cat. So, uh, so that's a spoof on, on how much we agree to do. So terms of service agreements have become so sweeping. And the fine print that we all agree to says, essentially, you post your content here and it's ours forever. And that's it. We don't have to ask you anything. We can change the terms of service anytime we want. So, uh, 
And here was an exhibit in San Francisco about the length of these documents. And people have calculated how long it would take us to actually read the things we say we read and understood. So something crazy goes on there. Um, about these terms of service. Uh, so Mozilla was uh, uh, sponsored this and they were the shortest. This is by now a nonprofit that came out of Netscape uh, uh, before. But you can see the, the, the terms of service were short and they grew and grew and grew and they are written in such a way that we can't even understand what they say. So when they say buyer beware and that's a solution to all our problems, let market work and if you don't like it, get out. What choice do we have? The power imbalance is is staggering and you know who can does it even make sense for all of us to read these things somebody should read them for us and decide if they make any sense i mean there have been experiments where people signed off you know their firstborn kid or something i mean obviously that's not enforceable but you know they are kind of crazy uh just as an example of something that goes on so getting back to media and information and uh Thomas Jefferson said, whenever, wherever the people, so these are idealistic notions of democracy and, 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 and media and how it works. Whenever people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. So we can have democracy working, just inform the people. So he said this in creating the University of Virginia. And Pulitzer on the media just basically said, let's expose it, let's have investigative reporting. There's not, there's only one way for democracy to stand on, on its feet inform public about what's going on. There is not a crime, there's not a dodge, there's not a trick, there's not a swindle, there's not a vice, which does not live in secrecy. Get those things out in the open, describe them, attack them, ridicule them in the press, and sooner or later, public opinion will sweep them away. So this is like, just get the truth out there and the public and democracy will, will, will take care of them. That is an idealistic notion of media from days in which, from the early 20th century, in which the media, you know, had certain, um, certain idea of its roles in society is sort of holding power to account. And Louis Brandeis, who was a Supreme Court justice, uh, had a famous saying, publicity is, is commended as a remedy for social and industrial diseases. Sunlight is said to be the best disinfectant electric light the most efficient policeman so just light but now we have so much speech that speech itself can turn against democracy or uh, you know against people speaking up or whatever so traditional media ideally was driven by a quest for truth and it trusts the reader to kind of figure out things and we just want discourse and we want uh, we had a fairness doctrine from 1949 to 87 which required by radio and television based on sort of scarcity that they had to do point to counterpoint and they had to give equal you know treatment and after that we had more siloed radio talk radio and things of that sort and of course, traditional media can can be trying to hype things, can be trying to sell scandals and 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 all kinds of things. So it's it's not immune to to falsehood and echo chambers and all of that. And you choose what to read, you choose which TV channel to to turn to. Social media is the wild west. Social media is open. Everybody, for good and for bad, okay, quick and open, user created content, so you can have sort of you know, journalists, you know, you can have viral videos of things, you know, so information gets out. Normally it's more democratic, but there's a lot of algorithmic curation that is very targeted. They kind of put a news feed on it and uh, their objective is to maximize engagement because that's how they sell advertisement. And that is become the business model of Facebook and Google especially. And by that they have completely robbed all kinds of other media, uh, which is sort of traditional media going online, like uh, from advertisement, um, by taking the lion's share of advertisement, basically killing local media uh, as well. So we have severe deserts of media in terms of just informing citizens. Uh, there's no investigation. It's just basically post quick and, and, and dirty on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, et cetera. YouTube, and they'll feed you kind of the next thing and the next thing based on what they think you like and what they think will keep you there. And some people have claimed this is an, an, an anger and hype and, and falsehoods. Uh, do you support regulating Facebook like traditional media company if it continues to distribute news on its platform? So the, the media does have some rules in this country. And 
you know, is Facebook a media company or is it just like, oh, I'm connect we're connecting people uh, while they engage in some curation and very targeted curation of the, um, you know, otherwise you go to a newspaper and it's whatever they have you sort of see and you choose what to read. 80% of you think, uh, yes, that it is a media company. And I'm not going to show you what my class, uh, but this is what, uh, what people said, just sort of like you back in 2018. So this is almost three years ago. Two thirds said yes, and, and another 28% were undecided, but only 8% opposed. So on Facebook, they would have, uh, they would try, they would claim that, you know, we, we want to fight fake news and, you know, bots and all kinds of noise that's there that's really harmful and speech, of course, can turn violent. We've seen that. Uh, so they say invest, they have 10 points about what you should do to avoid fake news or false news. Uh, investigate the source, they say, inspect the date, you know, uh, all of that. It's like what they're trying to make you do as a customer as a just a user is you know do what journalists do which is you know make sure this is correct well you know does that make any sense the shortcut is of course we need trustworthy sources so we end up you know paying subscription for some sources that we that, that we like that this free for all you know and throwing it back on people doesn't make sense and of course that their algorithms are doing curation uh, they're not generating the content and then they just go and curate them for their own purposes and 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 something has sort of gone wrong with that so back in 2019 uh, zuckerberg came back before congress uh, sorry uh this is october october uh I don't know why he was on, on a screen there. I thought this was, this may be, oh, the, this is from COVID. So this is, uh, the article is not from, uh, is, is from before COVID, but, uh, but this testimony picture is, uh, is, is there, I believe, uh, for sure with a mask. Uh, so let's just quickly run through what kind of agencies we have and what, where are we on this regulation of social media at all? We have a federal communication uh, commission, which is really about telephone, virtually no authority over the internet content. Uh, it's just about net neutrality. It's about technology in terms of connecting people, telephone and television and radio you know, licenses and things of that sort. So they don't really, they're not there in the space of media. FTC, Federal Trade Commission, is very reactive, very slow. What it, it's about is about, you know, uh, practices and privacy violation and lying to your customers. So they did give a fine to Facebook about, you know, privacy violations, but they're very reactive, very slow, and they're not really monitoring. If something goes wrong, then they can come and slap a little tiny fine, uh, but very, very minimal, uh, actually. So they're, they can probably do more, but uh, uh, that's that them. The states are trying to do some stuff. Uh, California enacted the Privacy Act. Uh, Illinois uh, was very forth, uh, very very forthcoming in, in in knowing about you know controlling the use uh, and the sale of biometric information like face uh, uh, um, the recognition and things of that sort. DNA. Congress has been willfully ignorant, very sluggish, very conflicted, a lot of rushing to all kinds of statements. Uh, um, the companies are saying, oh, please regulate me uh, nationally, not state by state, because every state, which they can control a little bit less, uh, sort of makes them have to change things. And it's a patchwork. Yes, it would be good. But the reason they really want national rules is because they know the process is going to be very long and that they can enter there and they have an impact on it much more so at the federal level. So this one, one article called for an independent expert agency. So just like we, we have an agency for important things that affect us, that we need to have some rules about the use of data and, and some, you, some kind of rules about how social media platforms should handle. They should have a reasonable, accessible definition of what speech they forbid, what speech they, uh, they uh, allow, and some way to sort of make sure that they are consistent in what they do there. Otherwise, they have this limbo where they do stuff and they respond to things that are become kind of annoying to people. And basically, uh, I agree with this statement. Social media platforms have abused the naive trust of their users across the globe 
perhaps it's time to ask them to trust us once more. In other words, get out of the way and let us think about what makes sense, how to define hate speech or harassment or bullying that goes on online. So Facebook right now is saying, oh, yeah, 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 we understand all of that and we're going to create an oversight board. So they create an oversight board that acts like a court. They call it, it's called Supreme Court, you know. So if they took down something or they didn't take down something, and of course, I, did, I tried to stay in the U.S., but there are huge issues all over the world and every government is trying to struggle with the same thing. And this was about, you know, you have articles about Turkey and about, you know, uh, Myanmar and all kinds of things uh, related to, to, to social media and even, you know, WhatsApp and, and others in very many countries, Brazil, etc. So they create an oversight board, but people are not happy with their oversight board. Did they, did they commit to taking the, the information from there? They commit that if they overturn their decision to take down or keep up or d delete somebody or whatever, that the oversight board will adjudicate that. But again, it's not quite the process with the transparency that we want. It's a set of people who, you know, Facebook said are independent of themselves of Facebook and will they will abide by their law. This happens voluntarily, just like arbitration works. So we can discuss the legal system. I'm quite interested in sort of private law. I will end sort of with a few, two points. First of all, um, there's a book uh, that's actually free that has uh, just came out recently uh, about social media and democracy, the state of the field and prospects for reform. And it kind of uh, ends by saying many, many important questions. So Nate Persili is here at the law school, remain to be answered. The answers are desperately needed to inform major decisions regarding public policy. The need for rigorous policy relevant scientific research has never been a greater, but in that last chapter, they point out, uh, Priscilla and Tucker, that it's about data governance and about who controls the, gov the, the data to do even that research, okay? The data necessary is largely controlled by private companies. So you're getting into an area where, you know, who, who is really in power? Governments need to spell out legally pass uh, safe pathways for granting researcher access, and then they need to require the platforms follow it. So can they filter the data people see, the studies? There's such overwhelming amount of data. Academic research has also become collateral damage in the battle between privacy advocates and the platforms. GDPR is a law in a privacy law in Europe that has chilled research. The companies are using it as an excuse not to give any data. And of course, Cambridge Analytica was also a crisis where an academic uh, betrayed uh, their, their agreement with, uh, with the company. So it was a huge problem, corporate scandal and, and democracy scandal, but it was also a political scandal, but also an academic scandal as well that wasn't discussed as much. And the big issue as well is the funding of research. How do you fund trustworthy research that's not funded by the company, that's not controlled by the company when uh, in this situation uh, where, where they're afraid of the, some findings? So I end by asking, what is the role of the university? Because I speak as a university professor and especially business schools in situations involving significant governance challenge. What I've realized is that we're not doing enough about this in business schools in general, both for the corporate governance and for worrying about the governance of society as a whole, including the, the, the society's governance of corporations. So we say things like change lives, change organizations, change the world, but what do we mean by change the world? How and on whose behalf? This is the Harvard logo. We educate leaders who make a difference in the world. What kind of difference? Uh, on whose behalf difference? I wanna highlight Arja Miller, who many of you, if you've been around, heard the name. Okay, so this is our beloved Dean um, of many years ago who died recently at age, uh, at age 101. Uh, and I spoke with him after he was 100 and he was very lucid. So I'm I, in awe of the person. And just about a year ago, I discovered a speech that he gave right before taking over the business school deanship here. And he was coming from Ford, uh, from the auto industry, was a whiskey, et cetera. If you read this speech from 1968, 52 years later, 53 years later, it, uh, 52, it's eerie because there's a sense about it, and this is the 60s, of you know, best of time, worst of time, and all of that. These are just a, a few choices, and he gave it, by the way, to a set of PhDs in my area, American Economic Association, American Finance Association, big meetings, used to be between Christmas and New Year, now they're in early January, 
we as people have the power, actual or potential, again, using the word power, to alleviate the ills of our present society, but we've not learned to use the power in massive ways to meet massive social needs. And he was talking about racial injustice and Ralph Nader and all kinds of things. We're failing to recognize that social unrest is an, can be an opportunity as well as a threat so you read this now when we feel like the world is coming to an end and it's really amazing. And at the end, speaking to these PhD economists and finance people, people in my area, we go there to interview, et cetera. Let me urge the academic people, whatever their field of learning, assume a larger role in helping to resolve the critical social problems of our nation face. Universities should of course retain their emphasis on teaching and research, but this does not mean that they cannot relate more effectively to the problems of the outside world. And he says the university has two advantages. First, it has expertise, interdisciplinary talents. The question is, are we interdisciplinary or are we in our silos to deal with complex problems? And second, university people can be more objective than either the private sector or the governments, which are sort of sides to this problem. Like who has power, government or corporations, which has become ever more uh, pertinent today. So are we part of the problem? Can we be part of the solution and how so? This is a collection of a few short pieces I wrote and you can find them uh, on, on my website, I'll show you in a second. Meanwhile, the Corporation Society Initiative that was mentioned in the, in the uh, purpose is something small I started at the business school that is trying to break silos, it is trying to encourage more debate. There's a website at the school. We just did a conference of corporations and democracy. All the videos are there. Some of these issues came up, money in politics, other things, corporations and democracy. What, how is it working? And we also have another website that uh, this is a very hybrid initiative with a lot of students active. And the MBA students of today want more of this content. Uh, I just think we're not providing enough of it and I hope we do more. Um, we have no, no, nothing about policy or law, very, very little in the business school. They created another, another website that they can control more on Stanford domain uh, and they wrote the mission uh, and you can go there and see. We just had a transition of leaders. It's such a short program, but we work closely with leaders, just one staff, couple of faculty, bunch of faculty affiliates, and we try to engage with everybody, including with alums, and that's partly why I'm here. And I feel that this is a legacy of R.J. Miller, what we're trying to do, because we also try to get involved in policy if we can, if we have expertise that we feel is useful to society. I changed my activities over the last decade, um, and uh, I added advocacy to the tabs, uh, and you can see some of these short pieces under opinion pieces, and I do all kinds of things. I probably post this uh, uh, under presentations uh, somewhere. Uh, and uh, that's the, that website. Thank you. So I'll stop sharing. I'll just answer questions now. Thank you, Anat. Uh, we have quite a number of questions. I'm going to group some of them um, that seem to fit together. We have a lot of AI questions. So first of all, how do you police AI generated content? And on the flip side of that, isn't the solution to, um, of moderation at scale to have AI be the ones that go through uh, and moderate? This is such a great question and it's a complicated question. Um, so yes, I mean, so, so there, how do you, we had in the course, uh, in the same class, Roger McNamee, who wrote the book Zucked, which is, he's an investor in Facebook and he just got horrified after the election and all the stuff that happened. What happened to Facebook? How has Facebook become this sort of harm on society thing? But he's an outsider to Facebook. And we found through some Stanford classes in engineering, a, a person who uh, worked at Facebook briefly after the election trying to fix it. And he's an algorithmic guy, a guy who worked uh, before that at uh, Netflix, uh, doing the algorithms that I don't really mind, that recommends movies to you, etc. cetera. Um, and he was saying, if you looked at the algorithm, you won't know it quite what it does. So it's a little bit of a trial and error. What we need to look at to kind of regulate AI is sort of really study the output of this system. In other words, how has it affected what people see, you know, how much of this and that content they see. So it's almost like most viewed 
most blogged upon kind of information that, that news media would give you. Uh, and definitely AI is being used to do moderation and, and Facebook claims that it has reduced uh, by a lot, you know, that they can stop some stuff at the gate. They have to decide how to judge it though. So there's sort of harmful stuff and, and, and uh, you know, indecent stuff and all of that, they do an easier job. However, what's been a complaint on the other side, in fact, my co-teacher, uh, Jonathan Dutton, uh, published uh, a piece on this because an op-ed on this recently about how sometimes takedowns can actually erase important evidence of human rights violations. If you went through uh, and, and showed Facebook a picture of, you know, a naked girl in, 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 in a village in Vietnam, they will kick it out. But it's an important picture and some atrocities that happen, human rights uh, people that they need like, you know, Syrian citizens to take pictures of, of, uh, of uh, you know, poisoning of people in Syria, uh, the pictures won't make it through the filters. So you just have to, to kind of draw really carefully about the line of, of, of what should be allowed where, you know, archives of things for, you know, for uh, kind of human rights violations or even genocides versus, you know, so some content, how do you train the AI to do just the right moderation? So it's very, it's very, very tricky uh, to do. And certainly it, it, we need it given the volume, we need some AI to sort of help flag things, but it's complicated. Uh, on the related note to who builds the AI and who polices the algorithms that police the content, how can we, Trust, who's going to decide what is responsible and reasonable when we have such a divided government where the two, you know, uh, what one person in Congress thinks is, is reasonable is very different than what another person. Yeah, so that's, that's a huge political challenge in terms of sort of diagnosing a problem, agreeing on basic facts and also what we want as a society. So I think Congress got itself confused and political and divided uh, and so are the people, which is why I also think, you know, if we can get through and that's also a tricky by itself in terms of convincing people with different views. So there's a lot of research on that. It's not in my field, but I think it's interesting, uh, you know, how people form beliefs or, you know, whether they believe something or want to believe something and all this, uh, sort of uh, motivated reasoning that people engage in. Back to the algorithmic uh, governance, uh, right now, the companies control the algorithm. I mean, if you look at corporate governance at, at, at Facebook, the reason they keep inviting Mark Zuckerberg is because actually Facebook is a, is a, a dictatorship. I mean, Facebook is controlled by Mark Zuckerberg. He owns, in, not own uh, a majority of the cash flow, the dividends, but he owns uh, a 60%, I think, of the votes on the on of the shares, because he has super shares. And that's a structure that has become popular in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, Theranos was controlled by Elizabeth Holmes, so controlled entirely. So Mark Zuckerberg decides. Now that algorithmic person who visited us was saying that, um, they were giving instruction to engineers and they sort of prefer them to be from China, he was saying, so they won't ask too many questions to say, okay, this is your objective. You're trying to maximize, you know, we're going to measure how much, how long people spend on the platform, you know, et cetera, something that they can monetize uh, as opposed to anything journalistic. So that's the challenge is that they are private companies and the algorithms they own and they control and, um, and it's a new problem that, that, that we have. So I think a lot of thoughts had to be given as to how to define parameters. And, you know, we have the First Amendment, so that's like a whole other issue in the US. Uh, and the First Amendment was sort of written with a different problem in mind than what we have today of sort of the government somehow silencing somebody. Uh, but that's, that's, that's not quite the problem we're facing with these platforms right now. Well, since you brought up uh, the First Amendment and the problems that we have in the U.S., what do you think about the Digital Services Act drafted by the European Commission? Yeah, so um, the Europe has been more, spent more time with more, um, 
you know, thoughtful process to try to figure out. Now, you know, the companies are mostly American companies, but they have to obey their laws uh, everywhere they are. And they oftentimes end up just wanting to do it across the entire uh, platform, although they do have to abide by local laws everywhere they, are, they go. And sometimes the government itself asks them to take content, et cetera, et cetera. In Europe, uh, they've been much more forthcoming on, on uh, and, and already have a few laws in place that are giving people a bit more right and control. For example, right to be forgotten is something that, you know, is basically you, you can, in Europe, ask companies to remove uh, content about you, which could really mess up your entire life if somebody even, it could be like a lie about you too. So the, the battle over, you know, what, whether you control your own presence online is, is one thing. They, I didn't delve into the details and the devil is in the details in a lot of these things. I think that some of the, some of the European, um, I think their approach is, is right, is right, which is, you know, to kind of create uh, and, and, and insist that the companies have a coherent uh, policy that makes sense and, and hold them accountable for, for, for keeping it and, 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 and for some form of, of transparency that allows us to make sure that they follow some kind of a process. They also have, they do not have the First Amendment. Again, it's national laws in Europe. So even whatever they decide in the European Union, they still have a lot of sovereign governments around. So Germany, France, UK, but UK is out of the EU right now, but you know, each country there also has an issue of integrating with its own laws. So Germany, for example, has laws ag against specific speech online so that you cannot post a denial of the Holocaust in Germany. So they just forbid that kind of speech. So I, and they in the US might be against, so we have very, very few restrictions on the First Amendment. So I, I, it, writing a law on this and a regulation is complicated than making it consistent with existing laws or maybe using existing laws in some extent, to some extent, to try to make some more order out of this mess uh, would be, would be past time in the US for sure. It's just, we have a really dysfunctional um, DC. I agree, it's very lamentable. We have a suggestion here. What if large social media platforms were treated as a public utility? Could that be a, a business model? Yeah, so uh, there, are, there are beginning to be similarities just in terms of the, the internet, uh, Per se, I mean, you know, trains, for example, were you know regulated under sort of a common carrier and telephones, and you sort of could, you know, you had to sort of provide across the board, and you had to, uh, and so you might say right now, you know, internet is is essential uh, infrastructure. Uh, for communication very much akin to, you know, telephone or post office or, or whatever, and that uh, you could um, do that. Uh, you know, obviously government bureaucracies, you know, have their own issues, but we do. Uh, so if you decide that there are, you know, regulated monopolies, do you want to have more competition? So different directions to go. I think it certainly should be on the table. Uh, I think uh, it's just a set of challenges that we have to decide how best to to organize uh, in terms of allowing, you know, freedom or trying to encourage competition. We also obviously don't have competition, but it's not clear that breaking up, it, that it's really more about data governance and where people want to be, where everybody else is and all that. So, um, but some people have argued that at least speech on, online is, is, is really by now sort of akin to, 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 to government, but then there's just, too much of it, and too much of it is harmful. In other words, the bombardment of speech and the distraction of, of, of speech is, is sort of not quite what, what the framers could have imagined. But it, it, it might be their way to, to go ultimately. We just have a lot to think about. This is sort of like the revolution of, you know, the print media, just the ability to get reach far at scale. It, it's, it's complicated. There is no very quick solutions to this. So one of the things I want to appreciate, it's hard. It's hard. The issues are really hard. I think we have time for one more question. 
so I'm going to go along with, with the idea of freedom of speech. Somebody mentioned that the right to speak doesn't necessarily mean it's your right to be heard. Uh, mm -hmm. Another person is speaking of companies like Parler and Gab, which were or are famous for specifically stating they do not moderate content. So if you join one of those, does that mean that you as a consumer are expecting and you know that you are in a situation where something is not moderated, um, but it could support or foment and enable violence? So what do you think? Yeah, well, we, we need to figure out, you know, what the, the, the limit of sort of harmful speech, and there is a lot of harmful speech around. Harmful speech can happen, you know, at small scale in the, in the school yard, okay, bullying, harassing, etc. But now it can happen on a major scale where a journalist could be harassed for, you know, for, for certain content that some people don't like. And there's just a huge number of stories uh, of, of, of that sort, not to mention, you know, bots and other things. Back to the issue of the uh, platforms competition on content moderation. Originally, that was sort of the idea that that CompuServe was sort of uh, saying we're not moderating anything and Prodigy was trying to be, have decency and have kids uh, online and, and, and sort of trying to moderate and they wanted to give them freedom. So the immunity of 230 was, uh, section 230 was about that. Uh, speech can harm and we just um, can get to serious violence and, uh, or other harms on other people. And uh, speech is very easy right now. So, um, I do think we have to come to terms with with what 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 are the you know if we don't change the constitution what are the legal parameters under which we can try to uh, to create safer uh, ways of communication and actually communicate uh, and have some kind of a truth when it's not Walter Cor Cronkite that tells us every evening what to think or whatever but like this this wild west that we have uh, online right now. In the last minute, I'm going to throw out another uh, interesting question here is what if the fix is simply that there is no further anonymity on the internet? Isn't anonymity a large part of the problem? Yes, it is certainly part of the problem. So the number of bots and sort of, you know, the fact that you don't have to, so in China, of course, you know, China is an interesting contrast to all of this because there the government just is strong and the government is doing everything and and you cannot you you or you they know exactly who you are so we are you know we want privacy right and then we want to be able to speak without uh, without but yes i think that uh you know it is something that if you if you speak you you have to be a person uh and and we can we should be able to trace your speech a bit because speech can harm so I, it resonates with me anyway but i'm sure there's you know all kinds of legal uh, legal issues that people might 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 raise uh about you know rights to privacy and, and there's a conflict there's a trade-off there there's certainly a conflict between some of these things we like that they don't always go together as well safety privacy encryption well, thank you so much, Anad. That brings us right, right to 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, wherever you might be in the world. Bye-bye.